from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Betsy Peterson. I'm the director of the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress. And on behalf of the staff, I want to welcome you all here today for the latest in the Benjamin Botkin Lecture Series here at the library. For us at the Folklife Center, the Benjamin Botkin Series is an opportunity for us to feature the best and latest scholarship from folklorists, from ethnomusicologists, oral historians, and other cultural specialists, and share that with all of you. It's also an opportunity for us to increase the holdings of our archive. All of these lectures are recorded and eventually make their way to our website and are preserved as a webcast so we can share this with people around the world and for future generations. So with that said, if you do have a cell phone on right now, please um, turn it off or you will be in our archive. Um, in setting up today's lecture, it's, I think it's a bit ironic that for the last century, folklorists and other cultural specialists, those individuals who have focused on documenting and recording the oldest songs, the most traditional songs, have often done so by going out in the field and using the most cutting edge recording equipment. Um, and wax cylinders, disc machines, wire recorders may seem like quaint um, objects or obsolete um, recording objects at this point, but in their day they were cutting edge and as cutting edge as the latest digital recording equipment today. And the music that was recorded on those um, machines, we know, has influenced all of us here in this room, and in part, one of the reasons kind of why we're here today to celebrate what that technology has brought us um, and preserve for us. We are also approaching the centennial birthday of Alan Lomax, and as many of you know, um, the American Folklife Center has the Alan Lomax collection, and we're proud to have it. But in coming up to the centennial birthday next year, 2015, we are hoping to develop a series of lectures and presentations which do celebrate um, field collecting, recording, and the whole um, enterprise that people like Alan Lomax have um, brought to us. And so this um, event today, the 78 Project, colon, Documenting Historic Sound in the Contemporary World, is the first in this series. So, um, and we're thrilled today to have the 78 Projects creators here, Alex Steiermark and Lavinia Jones-Wright, um, back to the Library of Congress. I know they've been coming here off and on over the last few years and getting a lot of ideas, and we're really thrilled that we were able to work with them and help them out. Since 2011, they've been traveling across the United States recording contemporary musicians on a 1930s Presto recording, direct-to-disc recorder, and filming this journey for an ongoing web series that I believe is on the ASCAP website. Is that right? Or it's just called Field? What is the 78 Project? OK. And they've also just recently com completed a documentary film. The 78 Project movie, which we will be seeing um, momentarily. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little bit more about their biography before we move on. Alex Steiermark is a director, editor, and producer whose previous feature films, including Pray for Rock and Roll, One Last Thing, and Losers Take All, have won accolades at national and international film festivals from Sundance to Toronto to Tribeca. Steiermark started his filmmaking career as a documentary film, um, excuse me, as a, docu uh, as a documentary cameraman and editor, and prior to directing, he distinguished himself as a film music supervisor and music producer, working with a wide range of recording artists, including David Bowie, Public Enemy, Michael Jackson, and DC's own Dave Grohl, and on films by directors such as Spike Lee, Ang Lee, Jonathan Demme, and Robert Rodriguez. 
writer and producer Lavinia Jones Wright is no less distinguished in her biography as well. She has documented and contributed to both the New York and Philadelphia music scenes for the last many years, most recently as a member of ASCAP's marketing department. She has worked on ASCAP's Playback Magazine, its website, award shows, ASCAP's field recording web series, and that's what I was confusing, I think, and coordinating ASCAP's Inside Music e-newsletter. As a journalist, Lavinia has contributed to Billboard, Spin, WSJ Speakeasy, AOL Spinner, Harp, Magnet, and Crawdaddy. She's organized concerts, festival shows, and various events all along the East Coast, and most notably is a founding member of both Philadelphia's Fresh Out Media and the Brooklyn Happenings. She's also recorded and performed as a member of the Lupi Lupine Choral Society. So today, uh, the Bakken Lecture Series is usually, as many of you know, an hour-long um, uh, lunchtime, noontime event. Um, and this afternoon, we're going to have a little bit longer uh, time. And so what I'm going to do, we're going to bring Alex and Lavinia up and have them talk a little bit about the film, and then we're going to screen the film, which is roughly an hour and a half. After that's over, we want to demonstrate what making a disc recording is all about. And, and Alex and Lavinia will answer questions about the film and the project and the recording process. And finally, I'd like to thank the members of the group Slavea for joining us today to serve as the demonstratees um, for the disc making process. Slavea is a Washington based women's ensemble specializing in the vocal folk music of Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, and neighboring regions. And its members who will be documented here today following the screening are Thea Austin. Ann Harrison, Karen Chittenden, and Helen Fedor, and they are also members of the library staff. I also finally, it seems appropriate, we should also acknowledge our, our fabulous uh, sound team headed by Mike Turpin um, in this event. But so before we begin, we have uh, another special little gem that we wanted to share with you. We were able to unearth uh, an historic clip of a Presto disc in action in 1937 um, that we found in our archive. And so I want to introduce Dr. Guha Shankar, who is the individual who found this gem and who's going to tell you a little bit about it, and then we'll move on with the rest of the program. Thanks and welcome. Thank you. So in 1937, the young assistant in charge of the uh, archives of the Library of Congress, Alan Lomax, uh, wandered the hills and hollers of Kentucky uh, among uh, in the, one of the first of his many pioneering trips that he made around the world. On that trip, he was joined by Elizabeth Littleton, uh, later to be his wife. And together, they recorded uh, several hundred songs in Kentucky and across uh, the South, uh, moving on uh, the next year to uh, the legendary trip uh, to uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I want to keep this very short, but uh, uh, I guess the subtext to Alex and Lavinia's uh, talk could be everything old is new again or the shape of things to come. And so, John, if you could start with this particular song. This one is uh, Samson Caldwell and Farmer Colette on guitar doing the song, uh, Jesus Getting Us Ready for That Great Day. So the very brief clip that you saw of the Presto disc cutter is, uh, is the topic for the day. And with that, 
let me bring you Alex and Lavinia. Well, that was a treat. That was amazing. Thank you. We're <laughs> kind of humbled to come after that. But um, we, we, I think, thank you for the lovely intro earlier, and thank you for having us here. Um, uh, the support of the librarian, Todd, um, has, has just been amazing. Nancy, thanks for inviting us down. Uh, it's, it's been really the core inspiration to this project to be able to come here and spend time. So it's a, it's a real treat and an honor to be able to play this for you. And um, I guess we'll show the film. And then afterwards, we're going to sort of give you a sense of what, what our normal 78 project sessions are like. Lavinia, you want to say anything? Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Talk to you later. Would you guys like to introduce yourself before we get started? Sure. Um, okay. I'm Thea Austin. Um, I happen to be a public events coordinator for the Folklife Center, but that's completely coincidental. <laughs> um, Nancy thought it would be fun to have some employees from the Library of Congress um, do this, and she offered the filmmakers a choice of different people, and they chose some Slavic singers. So, um, we have Anne Harrison from Fedlink, who sings lots of different kinds of things, Karen Chittenden, prints and photographs, and Helen Fedor from the European Division. Um, the two, we're singing two songs from two different traditions. One's Ukrainian, and the second one is Georgian, and we'll tell you about them later. On ye chodi barabashu na volet ye na shu zir zir na shirasu chasu mi barabashu prevale wakashu zir bona na shi na volite tiki cha. Oh, 
So I'm going to ask you guys to hold this for me for a second, and we're going to swap it out because the, the Presto does have the ability to play the discs back, but the playback arm is very heavy, and so we feel like it's better for the long-term preservation of the discs to play them back on the turntable. So I'm going to swap <coughs> that out. Oh, and have you guys hold this for me for a second. Okay. And maybe Um, yeah, the yeah the the um, the first one, the Ukrainian one, is a Vesnyanka, um, among Slavs generally. Spring and the coming of spring is very important. Um, the uh, this the words in the song and the practices that have sort of pre-Christian roots. We think there are a lot of rituals that have to do that are now associated with the pre-Lenten time that we think of as Mardi Gras or Maslenitsa, and um, mostly young girls participate in the burning of an effigy of the old mother year. So an old mother of straw is, is um, created and then burned. And this ritual has magical overtones, and the girls that participate in this are thought to have magical powers And um, when they're doing that. And this song is... Uh, has a bunch of girls warning a young man playing a drum not to come down their street because they know lots of spells, especially the girl with dark eyebrows. So, um, and yes, it was collected in Chernobyl, um, in the Chernobyl Oblast area, which is no longer inhabited. Um, and Anne taught us um, the Georgian one. Yeah, it's, uh, the, the second song is a song from Western Georgia. And it is um, like a table song, something that you might sing at a at a at table. Um, and I'm gathering that because the words are such that the host is welcoming his beloved guests, and he's asking God to uh, bless them, and he's very thankful for them um, joining him at at the table. And we we try very much to learn these songs from carriers of the tradition. And um, Georgians, if any of you know, who, who are very committed to their very, very long tradition of hospitality. So if you get invited to a feast, expect to eat until you can't move. <laughs> Would you guys like to hear it? Sure. Yeah. We've actually feasted with Georgians, believe it or not. Oh, well, then you know. So we know. We're
the, the, sh the microphone that we use is uh, from I th probably around 1951. It's a Shure 51 microphone. It's a design that was developed in the late 40s. The mic that came with the original Presto, actually that was one of the cool things about that clip that we saw earlier. You could see the original Presto microphone. And they don't, I don't think any of them have held up. They, they're, everyone that we've seen is really corroded. But we, we tested a bunch of microphones with this machine and this just happened to be the combination that we thought sounded right. So. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, Jeff Place and Todd Harvey, who are both in the film and they're wonderful <laughs> curators and provided great information and comic relief to the film and were so, so helpful in what, to us when we were making it. So thank you guys both so much and we're so glad that you could be here. What happens with all the original recordings that you guys are making? Um, we've actually been holding on to them now, sort of keeping them safe. <laughs> um, we had done um, the first New York series that we did, a web series, which is, for those of you who haven't seen it, we have a web series that's been ongoing for a few years, and uh, it's different from the film. But um, the first year, we, we actually auctioned off some of the discs to raise money for a musician's charity, the Music Maker Foundation. Um, and uh, after we did that, we realized that we probably wouldn't be able to get them back. So, <laughs> uh, and, and a few of our archivist friends told us we were maybe crazy for doing it. Um, uh, and you know, those included people like Roseanne Cash and Richard Thompson and, and Loudon Wainwright. And we, so we felt good about it, but we decided there were other ways maybe that we could help other organizations like that. So we've been holding on to them. And we, we, um, we play them back once for the artist and then uh, once to digitize them, which we do. We, we store them digitally and then we put them, put them away. Earlier this year, we launched a soundtrack series to the 78 Project. So the first volume, the 78 Project Volume 1, is available. Um, it's all songs from our first web series, which include the, the, the records by Roseanne Cash and Loudon Wainwright and, and Joe Henry and Richard Thompson. And then the recordings that you saw in the film will be available very, very soon and the 78 Project Volume 2. Uh, you can check our website, or it's probably going to be available by pre-sale within the next week or so um, on LP and digital. Microphone's coming. Oh, hi. Uh, how reliable is the machine, and uh, uh, it, do you find it uh, hard or easy to find replacement parts for it? Well, it's a, it's a funny question. Um, it's reliable only in that we have Alex. Uh, he's become one of the mo one of the one of what I always like to say is the foremost Presto repairman in the country because I don't know that there are very many. But he's also very very good at it and is able to. We we usually travel with two just in case one um, poops out. But that it doesn't usually happen because Alex is very good at maintaining them and very good at sort of. Um, making quick fixes on the fly. But as you saw in the film, they're not that easy to replace parts for because, well, while you can take one and sort of take parts off of it and put it onto another, um, because of the way that they were manufactured, the parts don't always fit from one machine to another. So it can be a little bit tricky. Um, but Alex has managed to track down about four that we use now, uh, one to really grab parts from to keep the other ones working. I, um, I follow your, your social media uh, work and I really admire it. And I wonder if you can talk about that, how your use of social media to, to promote the project and, and uh, if you could talk about your branding at all. <laughs> um, do you want to answer that? Um, <laughs> well, we, uh, um, well, we've, you know, even though the machine is, f this one is probably 1941, but, um, 
we kind of like to think that the project itself is really brings 100 years of technology together. And for us, the digital part of the, of the project is just as important. And in, in a way, the, this machine, we see it as sort of actually uh, an excuse to, to have this uh, experience with the artist because we feel like the recording process, the process um, sort of results in these definitive performances. Um, it's one take. Um, we get one take to film it and record it, and it becomes this very intense sort of collaboration with the artist. And, and, and uh, an extension of that is our ability to now um, share that on, digitally. And so when we're shooting uh, and recording, we're always tweeting and posting, and our artists are doing the same thing, and we're trying to always sort of have um, the artists the people that are following the artists, and or now we have a lot of people following the project, so um, it becomes this experience that um, uh, sort of uh, transcends the sort of the, the geographical limitations of where we are. Although one of the things that we found with the film is that it's a really analog experience, like you actually have to take this machine somewhere and sit down and make a recording with it, and so. Um, uh, the the social media part of it is 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 very much about um, sort of bridging all those gener you know those sort of technological generations and and we self distribute everything we were self distributing the film as well as the soundtrack and so that that aspect of it that being able to do it online is really um, important to us and. And um, so it all sort of ties together that way. We, we're also really, we are protective <laughs> of it as a brand in a way because um, we feel that the record is, a one, is like a unique artifact. And so we, we don't send out, and what, what's really kind of amazing is we've never had an artist ask us for an MP3 even when it's done. They just go away and it's done. And we've had this experience together and it's really intense and then we ultimately stream it. So. Um, where it, it's sort of about everything um, eventually returning to the one object, which is the record that we made. And, and, and all the, our use of digital technology is about preserving the uniqueness of that, that moment. The... The uh, the thing I uh, I wondered about when I first heard about the project is you know why why if you were going out and making field recordings uh, you know you you could get a technically better quality recording with a you know two hundred dollar Tascam portable um, but uh, is it uh, yet the uh, your subject seemed to seem to be really enthusiastic about it and and i'm sure that practically all of them have heard themselves be rec uh, heard of themselves recorded before it's not the first recording they've ever heard um, so is is it a matter of that what they're getting off on is the old technology and the the one take and it's got to be right and we're not going into a studio here or is there something else about it that i'm that i'm missing that's a really good question um, in many ways we have found that the um, the demands and the limitations of the of the format are very compelling for musicians. Um, we've been lucky enough to work with artists at all different stages in their careers, and we've found that for for all of them, it's meaningful. But sometimes, for different reasons, for the um, the more experienced musicians, you see that they have sort of because of the evolution of digital recording and. and in their lives, they've sort of eliminated risk by, by having the ability to do an infinite amount of takes. You, you start to just get to this place where you know, the performance is, is less important. And so with, this, with the knowledge that you get one chance and three minutes to do something, um, you find yourself focusing and experiencing that moment in a, in a completely different way. And I think a lot of the more experienced artists found themselves Focusing in a way that they hadn't in quite some time in their careers, and it, it's very—it's a very wonderful experience. And for some of the younger ones, it's—it's it's touching something that they have always idolized, a, a period in recording and artists that they've always put on a pedestal and, and 
wanted and finding that they are also a part of the same tradition that they are capable of performing at this level and creating something that is permanent and unique that way. So for, for everyone, it was very compelling. And for us, it was a reason to physically go and visit with people. It's, um, it's a very good excuse to, to travel the country and, and actually meet people and, f and find out what their lives are like and go to their homes and, and you know, experience their world a little bit as part of the recording process. So all of that plays into why it's, it's so fascinating to us and why it made for such an interesting journey and one that we're still on. And, and also, um, sort of to the point of what the subtitle of this presentation was, which I think Nancy came up with, or maybe, is, is that we, we're not actually um, interested in retro gear, per se. <laughs> um, what, we're not even really 78 collectors. Um, the, our interest in, in, in the project has always been our fascination with f field recording and, and documentation and documentary. And so we see this as a, actually as a music documentary project. Um, and we often get artists who want to record with us because they think it's a really cool piece of gear and we tend not to work with them because that's not what it's about. Um, it's really about um, sort of getting to the, what the essence of musical performance is. And so this, this machine is, is really great in, in sort of producing this context for, for really what's more about the moment of performance. And so, um, and, and it's very cathartic. And when we first started, we were kind of more, in, oh, it's cool, it's like this crazy thing, we're gonna go. The very first recording that we ever did was in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, which is the sort of the prologue. And um, after like two, just two, actually that day, we realized that really what it was about was, was, the emo was emotional, you know? And, and we started to see this over and over again when we did it with Roseanne. You can see the webisode with her on, online. She just started to cry when she hurt herself. And, and same with Richard Thompson. And these are people who've been doing it a long time and suddenly it becomes about something else. It's a, it becomes about how ephemeral this all is, the, this music performance. And, and one of the things that we were really uh, intrigued about in the course of making the film and we were so grateful to Todd and Jeff, is that it's also about the ephemerality of the objects themselves and how they can eventually disappear. So it's really, it's, it's really about, it's not about retro, we're not into the retro sound per se, we're really into the, the, the timelessness of the experience. So. Uh, well, with the room full of people that are here and you having done this now, and a lot of people in this room having spent time with those old field recordings. I'm wondering about the attitude of the players who recorded in the day and, and Alan and so forth, people going out, whether those were casual sessions, whether there was the sort of sense of pressure that, and preciousness that you talk about. What was it? You know, I mean, you're going to people's kitchens and porches, but yet they're recording. So what was the feeling and emotion that went on on those porches? Were they just playing like they would Thursday night the week before? Or are they actually feeling some sort of sense of importance and history when they were doing these things? And is it any different than what they were talking about? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, there's a room full of people, so I'm curious. <laughs> well, one of the things that we were always struck by with Lomax's recordings, and, and there are uh, people here are much more uh, expert and would love to hear what they say is we were struck by how humanistic Lomax's approach to the, art, to the people he was recording, where he was genuinely engaged, invested in, in their experience, which really struck us. And also that um, you get a sense that it is important to a lot of them, like you, you feel like the formality of their approach, the way that uh, we've had the opportunity to hear a lot of the recordings that maybe some people don't get to hear, where you can hear the Lomaxes talking to the artist and there's this back and forth and, you know, there's this, sometimes they're actually really staged um, and we, like Matt played us some from uh, Shreveport that were really staged, you know. He's like, don't be lazy. <laughs> he tells him, to like, do it, do it better. 
So, yeah. so I think in some instances they maybe weren't aware of the significance of what was happening, and in others I think they were really, like, it was really important. Like, they, it seemed like a special occasion. So, I mean, I don't know, but those, Todd, for example, has heard a million of them, so. I was just wondering if you could expand on this specific um, sound that the Presto produces as opposed to regular recordings. Um, what made me think of that was the uh, double uh, flutist where he said saxophones would be very wonderful whereas a clarinet would be not, would, would not be. And also I just thought with a little tiny second question, how would you think uh, a Robert Johnson or a Betty Smith would sound now on a recording? If that's part of their charm, of course they're songwriters, but their singing sound. Well, it, it's interesting you should ask about the instrumentation um, question because we actually found in a lot of the recordings that there were instruments that just pull through, that the presto just seems to prefer certain things. So if that instrument was present, no matter where you put it, it would it would pull through. And he was absolutely right about the saxophone. And that day that um, we recorded with the bow keys, I was moving that saxophone around and could not get it to be any quieter, no matter what we did. And the bow keys, those guys are, they're killer studio musicians and, you know, they don't like to be told to move around or to play quieter. So it was it was a challenge and I was asking him, I was like, man, do you think you could just get under the coffee table or like put the horn down there or something? Cause like I'm, all I'm getting is saxophone. And that was definitely true. We recorded with a, a band called The Wandering from Memphis and the, the singer and the fifist from that band, Sade Thomas's uh, Otha Turner's grand, uh, granddaughter, and she was playing his fife, and it, we had the same experience with the fife. No matter where it was, all we got was fife, which is great because the fife is, is cool, but it, it definitely sonically is, is selective and interested in certain frequencies, which definitely has an effect, and voices too, yeah, absolutely. It has an effect on, on what comes through and what you hear when you play the record back. Um, there's a lot of, there's so many people who are um, scholars of this particular subject. It's, it's one of those great record collector mysteries is what would, it, what would Robert Johnson have really sounded like? What, what, would have, what would any of those people sounded like? Because the format really does dictate a lot of the experience when you, for you as a listener, and I'm, I myself, I don't have a ton of theories on that, but. Um, Is that why you think that the people loved it so much to hear themselves sounding with that old time sound? Yeah. Maybe? Well, you know what's interesting if you if you remember from early on in the film, the the Reverend John Wilkins. His father was a famous singing reverend, and he was recorded by Lomax as well. His name was the Reverend Robert Wilkins. And the, um, when we played back jo Reverend John Wilkins' recording for him, it was the first time. It was, he was incredibly moved, and it, it was because it was the first time he ever realized how much he sounds like his father. And a lot of that is because the you know he heard his father recorded on seventy eight, and until he heard himself recorded on seventy eight, he didn't really make that connection. But he he sounds exactly like him. Um, yeah, and maybe I mean, do you do you want to? No, I think that's yeah that that's a great it, it it and it's a very it's a very good question, and I think a lot of our artists after they heard themselves played back had a similar experience. They really wondered, well, now that I know the difference between what I sound like here and what I know myself to sound like and what I hear on the, on the record, what does that person that I have been listening to sound like in, in their real life? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a huge question, and, and you know, we'll, we'll maybe never know, but it's a really cool thought. It's working. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Bob's question too, and then also put yeah. piggyback into a question to you, which relates actually. I think a lot of those fuel recordings, you know, there was the folklorists, and of course there was the commercial people, like you know, went down Ralph Peer and people who recorded in the South, and it's it, it's a mixed bag of kind of what they did, what they did. Because a lot of the experience in a lot of cases, and this is true with like some of the folklorists who had these theories and wanted the people to play music that like supported their theory. 
So they had they they had they put a, a filter on things, right? So maybe it's not what the person played on Saturday night. I remember um, my mentor Ralph Rensler recording Doc Watson was only would let him play old like folk songs that came out of like you know child ballads and things. That's all he wanted to hear because it confirmed what he thought Ralph uh, Doc should be. And and the same thing on the other side of the coin, you get these commercial guys down there who only wanted people to record things that they had written themselves so they could get the publishing. And put it out. They didn't want any traditional stuff. They they wanted something they could go up back and say Ralph Peer you know, publishing blah blah blah. But I happen to of course notice in your film that every song at the end was traditional. So this, it, it could be to filter up the artists you were dealing with. Did you actually how much negotiation or how much talking to them was was it where they actually just went and found all these old traditional songs? Um, well, in that sense, we applied a filter. Um, no doubt, uh, but but the reason in our, in we wanted to do that is a uh, the practicality of it, but that's only secondary to the fact that we were trying to really get as far deep into family history. Like we really asked people to come up with songs that um, that could show sort of a, a connect you know a connection to the past. So that was as part of the project. And and the most interesting example in some ways to us is 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 Cody's version of Billy Boy, you know, um, just because for those of you who don't know, uh, Cody Mundy was in Kid Creole and the Coconuts and he had these dance hits in the eighties and and um, I had known him from before and and you know, we, when we, we, we leave it up to the artist to pick the song. The, the only thing we say is, you, you know, we, we want you to pick a public domain song and, and you have one three minute take to do it. And we, we have a list, a reference list that people can look at if they don't, if they're just to jog their minds. But, but, but um, we, were, we didn't know what we were gonna do with Cody and he did it and, and it was great because it, it, it had a beautiful story, which was that he learned it f through the Fresh Air Fund, you know, and, and part of the whole point of the film was to show that, you know, you could go around the country and find people from, you know, seemingly different backgrounds, and they are all connected in some way to this pool of musical knowledge, so that's passed down in this way, you know. Well, I noticed some of them varied, like the guys that... Uh Took Lead Belly's Cotton Fields and were turning it into a song about California. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The 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 one exception. Well, d uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jaron's song is one of his pieces, whatever he made up on the spot, and and um, and then Holly doing um, I saw the light just because we she had done Amazing Grace, which we're streaming on our site, but it it was cool that it was her grandfather wrote the song, and we thought and we thought. Yeah, her grandfather's Hank, Hank Williams, yeah. So, um, and it's a really nice version of it as well. So. One more question? Go ahead. Uh, well, it's a quick, a quick answer to the question over here about you know, why, why, why things sound different. It's, it's because, of the, because of the microphone and the cutter. It's uh, uh, re resonances, uh, uh, the, the pick up pattern, what the microphone picks up that's not directly in front of it. And those problems are still with us today. Not, not the problems of the cutter, but, uh, but, but microphones. Uh, I, I've, I've done some field recording and uh, 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 I would take uh, a few microphones with me and we'd hang quilts on the, over the windows to, uh, to cut down on reflections and spend uh, you know, we might we might spend uh, half an hour to an hour of casual music, you know, just play something, jam a little bit, while uh, while I go out and change microphones and move things around a little bit, and um, so it was not nearly like a formal studio recording session, but it was a little bit more formal than showing up at their house with a recorder, setting it up, and saying, "Play a couple tunes for me." I'm afraid we're going to. I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, wrap things up now, just because of time. But I wanted to thank Alex and Lavinia for coming, and for you, for all all of you for attending. Thank you so much for having us. It's and our pleasure. We wanted to give you guys a heads up that at.
at pretty much every Q and A that we ever do, as we as we're showing the film, which now we're taking it on a tour around the country, we're always telling people that they should come and visit the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian. So if you start getting a whole bunch of phone calls, <laughs> we, we're trying to convince people to come and check out their their nation's treasures. So okay. thank you again. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.